NCLEX Q&A Daily Practice Part 11 21. You are teaching a client about the patient-controlled analgesia, PCA, planned for post-operative care. Which statement indicates further teaching may be needed by the client? A. I will be receiving continuous doses of medication. B. I should call the nurse before I take additional doses. C. I will call for assistance if my pain is not relieved. D. The machine will prevent an overdose. 21b. Patient-controlled analgesia offers the client more control. The client should be instructed to initiate additional doses as needed without asking for assistance unless there is insufficient control of the pain. 22. The nurse is teaching childbirth preparation classes. One woman asks about her rights to develop a birthing plan. Which response made by the nurse would be best? A. What is your reason for wanting such a plan? B. Have you talked with your provider about this? C. Let us discuss your rights as a couple. D. Write your ideal plan for the next class. 22C. Discussion of the provider's role and the couple's rights and limitations in selecting birth options must precede development of a plan. 23. The nurse is caring for a client admitted to the hospital with right lower lobe, RLL, pneumonia. On assessment, the nurse notes crackles over the RLL. The client has significant pleuritic pain and is unable to take in a deep breath in order to cough effectively. Which nursing diagnosis would be most appropriate for this client based on this assessment data? A. Impaired gas exchange related to acute infection and sputum production. B. Ineffective airway clearance related to sputum production and ineffective cough. C. Ineffective breathing pattern related to acute infection. D. Anxiety related to hospitalization and role conflict. 23b. Ineffective airway clearance is defined as the inability to cough effectively. While the other diagnoses may be appropriate for this client, this is the only one supported directly by the assessment data given. 24. A woman comes to the antepartum clinic for a routine prenatal examination. She is 12 weeks pregnant with her second child. Which of the following shows proper documentation of the client's obstetric history by the nurse? A. Para 2, Gravita 1. B. Nulla Gravita 2, Para 1. C. Prima Gravita 1, Para 1. D. Gravita 2, Para 1. 24. D. Gravita 2, Para 1. Gravita describes a woman who is or has been pregnant, regardless of pregnancy outcome. Para describes the number of babies born past a point of viability. Therefore, a woman pregnant with her second child would be described as Gravita 2, Para 1. Primipara refers to a woman who has completed one pregnancy to the period of viability. Multipara refers to a woman who has completed two or more pregnancies to the stage of viability. 25. When planning the care for a young adult client diagnosed with anorexia nervosa, which of these concerns should the nurse determine to be the priority for long-term mobility? A. Digestive problems. B. Amenorrhea. C. Electrolyte imbalance. D. Blood disorders. 25b. Amenorrhea. Changes in reproductive hormones and in thyroid hormones can cause absence of menstruation, called amenorrhea, which contributes to osteoporosis and bone fractures. 26. A client was admitted with a diagnosis of pneumonia. When auscultating the client's breath sounds, the nurse hears inspiratory crackles in the right base. Temperature is 102.3 degrees Fahrenheit orally. What other finding would the nurse expect? A. Flushed skin. B. Bradycardia. C. Mental confusion. D. Hypotension. 26. C. Mental confusion. Crackles suggest pneumonia, which is likely to be accompanied by mental confusion related to hypoxia. 27. The nurse is evaluating the growth and development of a toddler with AIDS. The nurse would anticipate finding that the child has a. Achieved developmental milestones at an erratic rate. b. Delay in musculoskeletal development. 
C. Display difficulty with speech development. D. Delay in achievement of most developmental milestones. 27. D. The majority of children with AIDS have neurological involvement. There is decreased brain growth as evidenced by microcephaly and abnormal neurologic findings. Developmental delays are common, and after achieving normal development, there may be loss of milestones. The other options are accurate but are too limited to be the best response. 28. The nurse would expect which eating disorder to cause the greatest fluctuations in potassium? A. Binge eating disorder. B. Anorexia nervosa. C. Bulimia. D. Purge syndrome. 28. C. Bulimia. With bulimia, the purging process tends to make the body dehydrated and to lower the level of potassium in the blood. Low potassium levels can cause weakness, abdominal cramping, and irregular heart rhythms. 29. The nurse is planning care for a client with increased intracranial pressure. The best position for this client is A. Trendelenburg B. Prone C. Semifowlers. D. Side lying with head flat. 29. C. Semifowlers. Maintaining the head of the bed at 15 to 30 degrees reduces cerebral venous congestion. 30. The nurse is assessing a client with a deep vein thrombosis. Which of the following signs and or symptoms would the nurse anticipate finding? A. Rapid respirations. B. Diaphoresis. C. Swelling of lower extremity. D. Positive Babinski sign. 30. C. Swelling of lower extremity. The most common signs of deep vein thrombosis are pain in the region of the thrombus and unilateral swelling distal to the site. 31. The nurse is assessing a newborn infant and observes low set ears, short palpable fissures, flat nasal bridge, and indistinct philtrum. A priority maternal assessment by the nurse should be to ask about a. Alcohol use during pregnancy b. Usual nutritional intake c. Family genetic disorders d. Maternal and paternal ages 31a. Alcohol use during pregnancy This cluster of facial characteristics is often linked to fetal alcohol syndrome, FAS. Lifelong developmental delays of varying severity can result. 32. A 14-month-old had cleft palate surgical repair several days ago. The parents ask the nurse about feedings after discharge. Which lunch is the best example of an appropriate meal? A. Hot dog, carrot sticks, gelatin, milk. B. Soup, blenderized soft foods, ice cream, milk. C. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich, chips, pudding, milk. D. Baked chicken, applesauce, cookie, milk. 32B. Soup, blenderized soft foods, ice cream, milk. In a child with cleft palate repair, parents should prepare soft foods and avoid those foods with particles that might traumatize the surgical site. 33. In addition to disturbances in mental awareness and orientation, a client with cognitive impairment is also likely to show loss of ability in a. Hearing, speech, and sight. b. Endurance, strength, and mobility. c. Learning, creativity, and judgment. d. Balance, flexibility, and coordination. 33. c. Learning, creativity, and judgment. Cognitive impairments are due to physiological processes that affect memory and other higher-level cognitive processes. 34. A client was readmitted to the hospital following a recent skull fracture. Which finding requires the nurse's immediate attention? A. Lethargy. B. Agitation. C. Ataxia. D. Hearing loss. 34. A. Lethargy. The level of consciousness or responsiveness is the most important measure of the client's rising intracranial pressure. Look for lethargy, delay in response to verbal suggestions, and slowing of speech. Assess for rising blood pressure or widening pulse pressure and for respiratory irregularities. 
There may be vomiting, usually projectile, without the presence of nausea. 35. A young child is admitted for treatment of lead poisoning. The nurse recognizes that the most serious effect of chronic lead poisoning is a. Central nervous system damage. b. Moderate anemia. c. Renal tubule damage. d. Growth impairment. 35a. Central nervous system damage. The most serious consequences of chronic lead poisoning occur in the central nervous system. Neural cells are destroyed by the toxic effects of the lead, resulting in many problems with the intellect ranging from mild deficits to mental retardation and even death. 36. The new graduate nurse interviews for a position in a nursing department of a large healthcare agency, described by the interviewer as having shared governance. Which of these statements best illustrates the shared governance model? A. An appointed board oversees any administrative decisions. B. Nursing departments share responsibility for client outcomes. C. Staff groups are appointed to discuss nursing practice and client education issues. D. Non-nurse managers supervise nursing staff in groups of units. 36b. Nursing departments share responsibility for client outcomes. Shared governance or self-governance is a method of organizational design that promotes empowerment of nurses to give them responsibility for client care issues. 37. In a long-term rehabilitation care unit, a client with spinal cord injury complains of a pounding headache. The client is sitting in a wheelchair watching television. Further assessment by the nurse reveals excessive sweating, a splotchy rash, pillow-motor erection, facial flushing, congested nasal passages and a heart rate of 50. The nurse should perform which action next? A. Take the client's respirations, blood pressure, BP, temperature and then pupillary responses. B. Place the client into the bed and administer the ordered PRN analgesic. C. Check the client for bladder distension and the client's urinary catheter for kinks. D. Turn the television off and then assist client to use relaxation techniques. 37C. These are findings of autonomic dysreflexia, also called hyperreflexia. This response occurs in clients with a spinal cord injury above the T6 level. It is typically initiated by any noxious stimulus below the level of injury such as a full bladder, an enema or bowel movement, fecal impaction, uterine contractions, changing of the catheter, and vaginal or rectal examinations. The stimulus creates an exaggerated response of the sympathetic nervous system and can be a life-threatening event. The BP is typically extremely high. The priority action of the nurse is to identify and relieve the cause of the stimulus. 38. A two-month-old infant has both a cleft lip and palate, which will be repaired in stages. In the immediate postoperative period, for a cleft lip repair, which nursing approach should be the priority? A. Remove protective arm devices one at a time for short periods with supervision. B. Initiate by mouth feedings when alert, with the return of the gag reflex. C. Introduce to the parents how to cleanse the suture line with the prescribed protocol. D. Position the infant on the back after feedings throughout the day. 38A. The major efforts in the postoperative period are directed toward protecting the operative site. Elbow restraints should be used and only one arm released at a time with close supervision by the nurse and or parents. 39. When teaching new parents prevention of sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, what is the most important practice the nurse should instruct them to do? A. Place the infant in a supine or side-lying position for sleep. B. Do not allow anyone to smoke in the home. C. Follow recommended immunization schedule. D. Be sure to check infant every one hour. 39A. Place the infant in a supine or side-lying position for sleep. Current thinking is that infants become hypoxic when they sleep because of positional narrowing of the airway and respiratory inflammation. The most compelling data comes from studies that link sleep habits with an increased risk of SIDS. Sleeping in the prone position may cause oropharyngeal obstruction or affect the thermal balance or arousal state. Sleep apnea is not the cause of SIDS. 
Because of research findings and the Back to Sleep campaign, the incidence of sleep apnea and the number of SIDS deaths have dropped dramatically. 40. A client is admitted with the diagnosis of myocardial infarction, MI. Which of the following lab values would be consistent with this diagnosis? A. Low serum albumin. B. High serum cholesterol. C. Abnormally low white blood cell count. D. Elevated creatinine phosphokinase, CPK. 40 D. Elevated creatinine phosphokinase, CPK. An elevated CPK is a common finding in the client with an MI. CPK levels begin to rise approximately 3 to 12 hours after an acute MI peak in 24 hours and return to normal within 2 to 3 days. Troponin levels rise as well.